This is Asian Insider and I'm Nirmal Ghosh. Now, President Donald Trump has yet to formally concede the election. It is possible we will not get anything official until December the 8th, which is the deadline for resolving all election disputes, and December 14, which is when electors in separate states cast their ballots. Those ballots are received by the Senate on December the 23rd, and on January 6th, Congress in a joint session reveals the count. The Joe Biden administration has plenty to take on in the aftermath of President Trump's tumultuous four years. The pandemic is wreaking havoc across the United States. Also high up on the foreign agenda will be the relationship with Asia. Now on this special edition of Asian Insider, my colleague and associate editor with The Straits Times, Vikram Khanna, hosted an exclusive panel to forecast what a Biden administration would mean for Asia. Joining him was Professor Tommy Ko and Professor Chan Heng Chi, both Singapore ambassadors, Straits Times Global Affairs correspondent Benjamin Kang Lim from Beijing, and myself based here in Washington, D.C. I want to ask, yeah. were you surprised by the result of the U.S. election, particularly its closeness, uh, or any, anything else about it that surprised you? You want me to go first? Sure. Don't sure. Thank you, uh, Vikram. Was I surprised by the uh, results of the elections and how close it was? Well, you can say it, may, it is not that close. If Biden ends up, and it looks like he will end up with 306 electoral college votes. And uh, it is quite amazing that uh, Donald Trump, President Trump, has garnered uh, about 71 million mm -hmm. votes, could be 72, yeah. you know. And, but uh, Joe Biden has garnered 78 million votes. That's a lot. Was I surprised? You know, I was asked many times, who will win? Mm. And I've said, this is a very close election. It's too close to call. But if you put a gun to my head, <laughs> I will say Biden. And I have said that to my minister, you know. So I was expecting a close fight. I never quite bought into the blue wave. Every four years, we have a mock presidential and vice presidential debate okay. in the college. And I managed to persuade the two parties in Singapore to nominate the four speakers. Right. And they are questioned by the student. At the end of the evening, the students were asked to vote. Okay. And in 2020, the students in my college voted accurately that Biden and Harris will win. Right. But they got it wrong because they thought they would win by a huge margin. Yeah. But as Heng explained, that huge margin did not materialize. But the margin is comfortable enough. Yes. Nobody can dispute. The, the majority that Biden has in the Electoral College in a popular vote, you know. We haven't had much of an official reaction from China. I mean, they have acknowledged the, the Biden victory. But from what you, you've been able to sense, how are people reacting? I mean, is there a sense of relief that the Trump era is over, that all the frictions will sort of wind down? Or do people feel that actually nothing much will change? It's hard to quantify because there are no uh, surveys here in China, right? Or at least pu uh, public opinion polls made public. But uh, party insiders that uh, the Straits Times has spoken to uh, think that it'll be more of the same, right? Uh, the, dif the biggest difference is uh, Biden will be reasonable, rational, and respectful, right? Other insiders are cautiously optimistic that some differences may be ironed out, but it'll be difficult for Biden to do an about face overnight. Yeah. Uh, there's a consensus in Congress and Senate and yeah. between Democrats and Republicans that uh, China is a competitor, if not an adversary. But it'll be worth noting that the, uh, it was a Chinese foreign ministry spokesman who belatedly congratulated Biden on November 13. Mm -hmm. uh, China was not being respect disrespectful, uh, and it's not counting on Trump to you know, uh, bounce back or hang on. But I think China was playing it safe, right? It's waiting for the official announcement, after which Xi Jinping will send a telegram or a cable to congrat congratulate Biden. Uh, China did this because uh, to give Trump face, hoping that he won't go to extremes in the run-up to uh, the inauguration or the handover. How will the working relationship change? Just, at the, the, just dealing day-to-day -day with the administration, 
when you're dealing with the Biden administration compared with the Trump administration, what kind of change do you anticipate in the working okay. relationship? All right. I, I don't want to be rude to the Trump administration. Okay. So I'll just say that I expect the incoming Biden administration um, to be stable, mm -hmm. to be rational, to have a lot of professional people in the various jobs. Right. And whether you agree or don't agree with them, at least you know what the, what the coherent policy is. Yeah? So I think that would be one major difference. Right. Uh, I agree with everything Tommy said that because as diplomats in Washington, what we want to find out is, you know, who do we talk to? Who do you speak to? And I believe during the Trump administration, because so few appointments yeah. were made, the diplomatic community just sort of talked to each other and said, who do you talk to? Who do you talk to? And the person you talk to, will that person get the message? Right to the right people in the White House. Essentially, if you listen to the noises coming out of uh, Joe Biden's advisors, you know, people like Kurt Campbell, Jake Sullivan, and so forth, who will be in the administration, they're talking about uh, competition without catastrophe. And, you know, that goes back to the coexistence principle. And there is a feeling that the, the US-China competition has gotten out of hand and the relationship is also uh, sort of too big to fail, as someone said the other day. So the idea is this sort of cooperative rivalry competition without catastrophe, where um, the US works, of course, with allies and partners, advances all its interests, network security, all these things, but also puts together the uh, conventional architecture of diplomacy with China, which is aside from trade, which has, you know, has, has, has kind of disappeared into the woodwork. One of them is, uh, you know, cooperation on climate change, cooperation on health and pandemics, cooperation on perhaps on uh, transnational organized crime, you know, the fentanyl issue, the opioid, opioids in America is a massive crisis. So the idea is, and this is an aspiration to carve out areas where we, they can work together while at the same time maintaining the strategic competition. And there is a consensus, bipartisan consensus in DC, in the security community, that China is the strategic threat. There's almost no doubt about that. But I mean, it's ambitious for them to think that they can actually cooperate in some areas. But if China is willing to do the same, then I think that's a path forward. And, and, and you know, going back, I think cold peace is a good word to, uh, to, to sort of sum up the, the end goal of that kind of strategy if it works out. Do you think uh, that the Biden administration will lift the existing tariffs? Uh, frankly, I don't know. but. But I want to say that... Um, will it be, I mean, will it be well, under I pressure to, to do I want to say that, that the Trump administration appeared to want to decouple the two economies. Yeah? It will be extremely painful to both sides and makes no economic sense. Yep. You know? I expect the Biden administration to stop this, to stop the attempt to decouple the two economies. There are trade problems between them, for sure, right. but these can be settled bilaterally through negotiation or through WTO, you know? They need not be turned into a, a national strategic issue. The first thing Biden will do is not going to be uh, reversing the trade yeah. tariffs. Huh? Okay. He has so many things to mm. sure, sure. attend to. Yeah. So probably tariffs will come in second half of 2021, uh -huh. where they will focus on it. But there's a lot of, there will be a lot of back channel discussions. You mm -hmm. know, that's how things happen. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, Hank Paulson, who's such a good friend of, the, China. of China, actually said there should be targeted reciprocity. In other words, if tariffs are to be lifted, what will China give to the US? So mm -hmm. this is, you see, they are signaling publicly how to do this. Okay. And we've seen other friends. I read John Taunton my global co-chair for Asia Society, say to SEMP, South China Morning Post, sorry, your rival. No, that's but, right. uh, no worries. You know, but uh, he said that actually the committee that was formed, the discussions between Liu He and like Ziga, mm -hmm. like Ziga, that should be continued because it was very constructive mm -hmm. and both sides got to know each other. So they should talk to each other to see what tariffs are to be lifted and when and what do you get back in return. As for decoupling, um, 
I think China also is going the decoupling path. It's not just Trump. Mm. I think China now feels that, goodness, you do not know what's going to happen with uh, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. United States. It's not like it's the epiphany now that Biden mm -hmm. has come in, you know, has been elected. You can always revert back. I think that would be in their yeah. minds. Could, could I just sure. ask Benjamin a question? Yes, of course. Because the Chinese leaders have recently talked about um, two circular economy. Dual. Yeah. Dual, Dual no? circular. Yeah. So <clears throat> what, what does this mean? My understanding is the West has become unreliable. We can no longer de depend on the West, especially America, for the market or for technology. Yep. So we must become self-sufficient. You know? So that's what, what they mean by dual circular economy. Right. To, be, to reduce our dependence on the West, in, increase our own technology, uh, find markets elsewhere. You know? So they are, they are doing this in response to America. Yep. Supposing Biden were to stop this attempt to decouple the economy, would the Chinese also modify its stand? That's a question I will ask Benjamin. Yes. Ben, that's for you. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Cole. Uh, so um, China will never publicly say that they're dropping the dual circulation policy, right? But you are exactly right when you said that, you know, this is defensive in nature. Uh, China did this just in case, you know, Trump uh, uh, gets a second term, wins the second term and continues to uh, uh, pressure China. But uh, China, of course, uh, will make tweak the policy because uh, if uh, they can continue to export to the US and the rest of the world and Europe, and uh, then uh, it's, uh, it's, it, this is, uh, the exports are one of the three pillars of the Chinese economy, uh, including uh, consumer spending and infrastructure spending. But uh, it's hard to replace exports, uh, this pillar. And so I think China will uh, tweak that policy. Just a final thought uh, from our guests. Uh, uh, would the Asia-US relationship be in better hands under a Biden administration than a Trump administration? Just a quick response to that. Heng, Heng Chi, would you like to? Yes. 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 I'll answer, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So One-line one explanation, why? Yes. I think it's, there's greater predictability and uh, there is, I think, I believe the Biden administration would like to move towards stability okay. in the relationship with China, which is the defining relationship in the region. I do not think the Trump administration and President Trump himself really uh, puts too much weight on stability and predictability. Right. Tommy, you have the last word. Uh, okay, so my, my last word is in the form of a message. Yeah. A message to Biden and the Democrats. Come to see. We know that you have to be faithful to yourself. And every American administration, especially a democratic one, must uphold the values of democracy and human rights. But I hope that in your formulation, the execution of policy towards Asia, that you allow realism pragmatism and wisdom to prevail over ideology. Any attempt by the Biden administration to divide Asia and to form an anti-China coalition will fail and will not be welcome. Thank you. On those, you want, to you want a qu final, quick final thought? Uh, I, yes, I think I've said this before and I want to emphasize this, that when the Biden, I want to tell Joe Biden's team and President Biden that when you return to Asia, Asia is a very different place. You will find a very different Asia. In the last four years, Asia has changed. Asia is now with countries, small states, middle powers, and big powers who have a sense of agency. Okay. They feel they can shape their own future. They've taken a lot of initiatives in the absence of American leadership, and they should bear that in mind. So they should come to the region, but they should consult and listen. Thank you. That's well said. I think uh, as a good note to end on, uh, I have to thank our guests, uh, uh, Chan Hengchi and Tommy Ko, who've added so much value. 
as also have our correspondents, uh, Nirmal Ghosh, our bureau chief in Washington, and Benjamin Kanglim, our senior correspondent in Beijing. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts.